Geogadka. Webinaria. It's mainly about evacuation in the area of Hormsland and also a general introduction about what evaporation is. So, yeah, so I first go through the content I want to present. So I will start with introducing you to Hormsland, to the study area, how it looks like and anything you can expect there. Then I will give a introduction to the hydrological cycle, which is a main part for studying evaporation because we want to apply the evaporation to the hydrological cycle or to water balance. Yeah, after some introduction to evaporation, I will continue with what are the main controls of evaporation. And then I will go on how you can measure evaporation and calculate evaporation values. And in the end, I will go what I actually do with evaporation and what kind of results I obtained so far. And just a general summing up at the end. So where is Hormson? If we look at the world, we are in Europe and we have to go far, far north to Nishpitzberg. The Svalbard archipelago. And if you are there, you normally land in Longyearbyen, which is the red dot on the map. And from Longyearbyen, you have to take the boat. Or, yeah, sometimes in winter it's also possible to take the snow scooter. And you have to go down south to Horizon. So in Horizon, we have a Polish power station. That's where we normally stay for the research. and my study area contains the two catchments, Uglebecken and Adiabecken. It's the, they are pretty next to the station and therefore really easy for us to go there and take our measurements. So this is how it looks like when you come to the station. It looks quite, uh, yeah, sparsing vegetation. You have some tundra, you have some mosses. And you have a lot of rock. And since we're doing our study on blowing water, we mainly go in summer. So therefore, we have less or no snow conditions. But the horizon can also be pretty green. And it says that there is water and also living vegetation, which is also important for the evaporation. I want to introduce you to the landscape at Hornsund. As I said, you have a lot of rock. You have small streams, a lot of quite a rock terrain. It's uh, the lower part of Google Becken is flat, or most flat, and then you have mountains behind where you can see little streams coming down and also green vegetation patches. It may be looking pretty dry on these images, but it's not as dry. And yeah, the main influence in the region is also the nearby glacier and the ice, which has a cooling effect on the whole atmosphere or climate there. And what's also really important is Robinson has permafrost regions, so it means that we have ground which is frozen and which is towing in summer bit and freezes again in winter. And the vegetation is more pretty short. We have shrubs, we have some lichen, we have really small vegetation and it can be quite colorful in summer time. As I said, it maybe looks that it's super dry there, but it's not. In the lower part of our catchments, we have a um, pretty much swampy area, and we have a lot of water on the surface, like you see in the lower left picture. And this is actually the main source for evaporation, the water we see on the surface. And when we have flowing water, there is often also a lot of really green and moss around. And this is a picture I've taken uh, this summer. It shows in the, yeah, in a really 
paint line in the middle of the picture some evaporation, which means uh, water which is moving from the surface to the air. It's not fog, it's a uh, really water which is evaporating. And as I spoke of permafrost, it is important to know that in winter the ground freezes in Hornsund. And due to this ice, we have like a lot of below surface ice in the whole catchment. And this is really important for our behavior of the water flow in the catchment. So as I said, it's important for the water flow. As a hydrologist, we mainly speak about the hydrological cycle or the water balance. And with this, we mean that everything which is raining down, which is the precipitation, is either going up like in the runoff, which is the stream flow, and it goes to the sea, or it evaporates, which is the water moving from the surface to the air. And then we have this equation should always equal to zero. And if it's not, it's just um, counted as a storage change, <clears throat> which means we have uh, storage changes like we have a accumulation in a lake or more groundwater, which is staying there for a long time. And maybe the graph from the previous slide was pretty simple. Uh, the water cycle is sometimes pretty complex and many different procedures are, are accounting to it. What we are looking in the evaporation or what I will talk more in this presentation is the flow from the surface water to the air to the water vapor and then how this uh, process is changing and how big it is in horizon. And in case of uh, horizon, as I mentioned, the permafrost or ice is pretty important. So we have a lot of ice layer below the ground. And this ice is like a solid body. Therefore, if it's raining on ice, the water doesn't infiltrate to the ground. It's uh, mainly because the surface runoff. But if we have more and more melting ice in the ground, it's more space available for water going into the ground and flow below surface. And this is a pretty important uh, process happening in Honsu right now due to climate change and warmer conditions. More and more of the permafrost is melting and the water fluxes are changing. So we have more water who can go into the ground, more water which is maybe available. We have different patterns of precipitation and therefore we study how does the evaporation change in this changing conditions in Hornsund. Yeah, that's actually all I wanted to tell so far to the water cycle. You can ask any question if you have so far, or then I continue with what I mean with evaporation. So as a hydrologist, we have mainly some kind of definition for the evaporation. It's the so first of all, we have the potential evaporation, which means it's the maximum possible amount of water which can evaporate from a free surface, water surface. So it means we count as potential evaporation all the water which is going from a lake or from an ocean to the air. This is the maximum we can have in the potential evaporation. And then we have the term potential evapotranspiration. And this transpiration part means the part when vegetation is breathing or when water is going through vegetation to the air. And if we speak of the potential evaporation, evapotranspiration, we mean that we don't have any limit of water. So there is enough water. Water is 
fully available to evaporate immediately. What we actually are interested in is the actual evapotranspiration. This means we are interested in how much water is really evaporating to the air. So if you can imagine the potential evapotranspiration is if you water your plant and you have a fully wet soil and the water is flowing out at the bottom of your plant, while the actual evapotranspiration is the situation you normally have, you have water, but you still have space in the soil to add more water. And that's what we are most interested. I know these terms are pretty complicated for a beginner, so I want to ask you if you have any ideas where we can uh, experience evaporation in daily life. So, as many of you know, when you cook water, you have steam coming out of the pot, and this steam is actually the evaporation of the water within the pot. So, water, if it's a, a not hot, it will uh, change the. No, if it's a not hot and you have a uh, air which can pick up water, you have steam created and it will create this nice steam out of the pot. In winter time, many of you may use these air wetteners. It's also the process of evaporation happening there. When you buy sea salt, it's mainly you take uh, ocean or sea water and you just let the whole water evaporate and what's left over is the pure salt. So when you hang out your washing outside or inside, the main process leading to dry clothes is also evaporation. And when you take a shower or you go for a swim, you come out wet of the water. And you may be all experienced that by the process when you're drying, it's getting cold for yourself. And this is exactly what happens in evaporation. So to have the water transforming from a liquid state, like a water drop, to water vapor, the water in the air, it needs energy. And the effect is that it will cool. So therefore, if you go out of the water and you dry, you have a cooling effect. And that's actually evaporation you experience in daily life. So what are the controls of evaporation? As I said before, evaporation needs energy. And the main source for uh, the energy is the sunlight or sun energy. And this energy mainly influences how much or yeah, how much water you can evaporate. Then you have near surface conditions which are influencing the evaporation, its temperature. Temperature is mainly due to the warmer it is, the more you can evaporate, the easier it is. You have humidity. It means if you have a glass of water and you go to a tropical climate with high humidity, <clears throat> the water will slower evaporate. And if you go to a desert where it's super dry, the water will evaporate much quicker. Then wind is a factor because wind influences how much air or will pass over the surface. And the more wind you have, the more evaporation can occur. And boundary layer characteristics is mainly how the surface is looking like. So if you have a really flat surface, it's, um, yeah less good for evaporation than if the surface is turbulent. So it mainly means that if you have more uh, yeah, rough surface, it favors evaporation. And as I said before, we have the process of evapotranspiration, which is the water going through the plant and evapotranspirate to the air. And this is happening mainly at the leaves, where you have small holes called stomata. And through the stomata, the water will go to the air. And 
For sure, all these processes are nice, but if you have no water, you can also have no evaporation. Therefore, water availability is actually the most crucial point for evaporation. Um, I will go on how you can measure this process, and I will present you three types of measurement instruments, how you can do it. The first thing is an evaporation pan. It's a pretty easy tool, so you have an instrument and you have a pan or just a pot filled with water, and you can measure the weight of the water. So how heavy is the ball filled with water? And if you measure the ball within several time steps, you will see water is getting less and less. So the weight of the ball will reduce. And based on this simple weight calculation, or way to, yeah, you know how much water is in the ball, how much surface you have, and from this you can easily calculate how much water is lost to the air. Then we have a more complicated tool. It's a lysimeter. A lysimeter tries to simulate the real conditions. And therefore you have actually, so it's pretty similar to a pen aerophrometer, but it's a big pan which is filled with soil, vegetation. So you have a real piece of the earth put into the lazy meter and it should be interacting with the surrounding so the whole lazy meter is digged into the ground and at the bottom of the lazy meter you actually measure also weight and other parameters and estimate how much water was going to the air it's a yeah so you have a pretty simple technique you have a this technique in a more complicated way. And the most advanced technique is something like an eddy flux tower. And this measurement actually is just measuring the air passing through the instrument. And based on the fluxes or how the air is moving while passing through this instrument, the evaporation or the amount of evaporation is calculated. So there is different methods to calculate potential evaporation. So how to calculate the maximum amount of water which can evaporate. Yeah, please don't run away because of the formats. I will explain a bit in how they are behaving or what is the sense behind the formats. So we have like different kind of types of models. For example, we have temperature models, and they I put here the formula of Hamon, but it doesn't matter which formula it is. The temperature models mainly based on the air temperature and the sunshine duration. So it's just the equation which takes in the temperature and sunshine hours and calculates evaporation from it. Then we have radiation models. These models are mainly based on how much radiation or energy you get to the surface. So how much energy is available to evaporate water. And so you see the R is the energy coming to the surface and lambda is like the the process you need the energy for the transition of water to water vapor. Then we have a combination of temperature and radiation models, the temperature radiation models, and they just combine the two processes of the previous ones and add them in a formula. And the most or the most common used one is the combined models. And these models are actually using the energy balance for the calculation of the evapotranspiration. So they use it how much energy is consumed and used, and yeah, they seem to be pretty complicated. They are quite complicated. They use a lot of inputs, but yeah, just because it's the golden standard to use, 
it's maybe not the best estimate for yeah field studies like ours. So why am I studying evaporation? So first of all, we are interested in the hydrological cycle in these high Arctic catchments in the horizon. And as well, I was reading through literature, evaporation is not that well studied in high Arctic. And most of the studies about evaporation are dating back to the early 2000s. And according to them, an annual evaporation rate of 80 millimeters per year is estimated. But due to climate change and rapid warming of the Arctic, we know that temperature was increasing a lot since 2000. And therefore, it's likely that the estimates of 80 millimeters per year is maybe far too low. And we did some in situ measurement of evaporation in Hornsu. And I also calculated the measurements, uh, the evapotranspiration with the formulas I showed you before. And based on these estimates, we tried to get new values for evaporation in Svalbard. And with this, we want to reduce the uncertainty of our measurements for our values. I just want you to show you the short video about how you can see or how evaporation looks like in Hornsons. So this is the video from June. And this slightly moving foggy like thing is the water vapor which is coming from the surface and goes to the air. So it's quite impressive to see it in Arctic because yeah. Normally, people say, yeah, it's too cold, there will be no water to evaporate, but we could see it's there and it seems to be quite a lot. Yeah, so as I study the evaporation, I use these small pan evaporometers, mainly because they are pretty small, so I can carry them wherever I want. They are easy to handle, I just need to pour water in and save it from animals, that's why they are in cages. But it's, so when you have a pan evaporation, then you want to see how much water goes from the pan to the air. But in, yeah, nature, we also have rainfall. That's why you put it in a cage with a roof, which is mainly there to protect the pan from getting refilled by rainfall. But however, our evaporometers still get a bit refilled, especially if there are high precipitation or high rainfall in the forests. And we also realized that if it's super windy, the pan is slightly shaken on the evaporometer. Therefore, yeah, we can get higher. Yeah, we just have to take really care about what kind of measurements we get on these days. And unfortunately, our measurements are pretty interesting for wildlife in the Arctic or in Hornsund, and they like to play with our cages or our devices, and sometimes they destroy our measurements. Yeah, that's, yeah. So therefore we have to check our measurements with the meteorological conditions in the time we took the measurements, and we also compare these values within multiple devices and just to see if the range and everything is looking fine. I want to show you how I process the data of this evaporation pan. So when I just plot the data I got, so I placed it in June on the 23rd June in, and then I collected it in 15 September. And what I see from my raw data is just a line going, yeah, the amount is rising, and then I have a sharp drop, which is the time when I was refilling the pan, and then it rises again, next refilling rises, and then you have a not as sharp refilling. This was mainly when it was super raining and the pan was refilled by rainfall. 
So since this data seems to be, yeah, for me, quite noisy, I like to have the amount of evaporation between each measurement. So I just calculate the difference between each of these points and I get something like this blue line. It maybe looks even noisier than before, but therefore I just summed all the measurements I got from one day to a daily sum, and I get something like this. And since I knew when I was refilling, I excluded these dates already, but I still got negative values due to rainfall events. And yeah, as I said before, evaporation is the process from water going to the air and not rainfall. So therefore, I just exclude all the negative values from my data when I'm processing and I will get something like the green line, and that's what I use for my further analysis. And that's actually all I do with my evaporometers. I use this, yeah, calibration, uh, this processing, compare it, and use it for further analysis. For the potential evapotranspiration, like the maximum amount of evaporation I can get within the period, I use different kind of formulas for calculating. It's not important what they are, but I just use many formulas, calculate them, and get rid. And when I plot all these formulas I used over the time and added the measured values, the measured values are in red, I get something like this, and I can confirm that my measured values within the, uh, with the evaporometer are in range of the potential models, most of them. And this is actually my confirmation that my calculations and my measurements are pretty okay. So since I told you before, literature said that an annual evaporation rate of, like say, 80 millimeters per year is known as the yeah, for Walmart. I was interested if my values will reflect this 80 millimeters per year. Therefore, I summed up all the days when I had my instruments in the field and just summed all the daily evaporation values for the measurement period. And as you see in this graph, most of the sums are exceeding or higher than 80 millimeters. The only models which are not getting up to 80 millimeters are the temperature-based models, so the models which only take temperature and sunshine hour into account, they don't get as high to 8 millimeters. All the other models and my measurements are higher. And you may be saying, yeah, but 2021, the measurements were lower. Yes, it was when the, we had some problems with the device and we had many days without any data. So I have a pretty complicated graph here, but yeah, I will explain you. So first of all, we have on the right axis, the green one, we have the values for temperature and radiation. So when you see, look at the graph, you have a black line, which mainly goes from low, it rises in summer, and it goes low again in winter. This is the line of the net radiation. So it's the whole amount of energy going coming to the surface and going out from the surface. So you have sunlight coming, warming up the thing, uh, the surface, and then also the temperature, surface temperature, radiating to the air. This is the black line. And it's typical that if you have sunlight, radiation will be higher, and in polar night, when you have no sunlight, it is negative. And when you look at the radiation models, like um, the orange line, the green line, or the combined models, they all use radiation as input, and they pretty follow this pattern of 
low values in winter and then doing a like bell shaped curve over summer and then going low again in winter for zero. Then we have the temperature. The temperature is the red line in this image. And temperature is low in winter time, and then it starts to rise from yeah, April on and peaks in August, and then it goes down again. And when you use a model who uses temperature for the calculation, the maximum evaporation in these models is also in more or less mid-July till August. And the radiation-based models, or the models who use radiation, they have the maximum peak, or they also peak in mid-July to August, but they also have high values in the months before. And this is exactly how they... It's just to show that the model follows the input. So if you use some kind of input, the model will reflect the pattern of the input. So you may be asking, why do we need new estimates? As I mentioned before, climate is changing. And Svalbard is among the fastest warming places on the Earth. And these changes have huge influences on the water cycle. And the pattern of rainfall and runoff in our catchments. And these changes have been observed by my colleagues. And yeah. They are still changing and ongoing. And yeah, many say that evaporation doesn't matter in high Arctic. But according to what I found out, it matters. And yeah, it influences also what we model with the different inputs. So what for what do we use this new thing uh, values we got? First of all, we want to understand the whole process in the catchment. We want to see where does the rainfall go? How does it, uh, does it below surface? Is it on the surface? How much will it stay below surface for how long and whatever? And we are also interested in all these kind of processes. And one of them is evaporation. And we believe that if we understand each process, we can know more about the whole catchment and how it will behave. Therefore, we so when we know how this catchment in Svalbard behaves in climate change scenarios, we can use this behavior to catchments in a more populated areas like in the Alps. Because also out uh, in the Alps, you have permafrost, and it's also towing. Maybe not as fast as uh, in Svalbard, but since we have a short time for huge changes in Svalbard, we can use these observed changes to apply to the Alps, where we have a longer time for similar changes. And yeah, what why we do study evaporation exactly is then we know about how much rainfall we have. We know about how much runoff we have. These are the, let's say, easiest part to measure of the water cycle. And evaporation is quite complex because of the limitations of the measurement instruments and also a lot of, yeah, the assumption you have to take. But subsurface water is even more complicated. You have to drill a hole and get the amount of subsurface water. And as I showed you before, in the beginning, the water balance is mainly uh, all the rainfall is equal to evaporation and runoff, and then just everything which is left, we add to changes in the storage, so storage in subsurface water in like And when we have better estimates for the evaporation, we can also have better understanding about the water storages or the fluxes within a catchment. And 
Why we do it? Because we are using also hydrological models. So we want to model how these water fluxes are within a catchment. And you can model a lot, but you should always validate it with observations. And therefore, we want to have real time or real observation of evaporation. So we can trust what the model is saying. Yeah. So to sum up all I said is the process of evaporation or especially land evaporation is still understudied in the Arctic. Our measurements with the evaporometer and also the calculation indicate that the value of 80 millimeters per year from early 2000 is far too low and we always have higher values. Then what we learned is it's really important to calibrate and calibrate the potential evaporation formulas to local climatic conditions. And we also learned that temperature-based models are underestimating evaporation, especially in cold climate, and also that uh, the choice of which kind of model you use, if it's more radiation-based, more temperature-based, influences the outcome of simulated runoff. So what I wanted to talk to you is I just wanted to show you that evaporation is a key component of the water cycle, but it is tough to measure and calculate evaporation. And I hope that you learned something about evaporation or the process of water going to the air. So and I will finish my presentation with some nice pictures of local wildlife and I'm open for any questions you have. Projekt Geogatka. Geofizyka dla każdego. Jest współfinansowany ze środków Ministerstwa Edukacji i Nauki w ramach programu Społeczna Odpowiedzialność Nauki.